All right, let's talk about this uh, course. First of all, notice that the course materials are going to be available at philip.greenspun.com, internet-application-workbook. So the idea is you won't have to actually think too much. There's just going to be this textbook that's going to link to everything else, uh, which is in uh, sharp contrast to previous semesters of this course. So there's even an introduction justifying the course. Um, and it starts off with the observation that 12-year-old can build a nice web service using only the tools that come standard with any Linux. So we've actually seen this, right? There's that little punk, Aaron Schwartz, that we gave the Ars Digita, one of the Ars Digita prizes to. And uh, when he was 13 years old, he downloaded Postgres, OpenACS, and uh, set up his little online community in one morning. Um, so you might want to say, well, why are we learning this? If a 12-year-old can do it all, we could just you know, find a 12-year-old and give him some candy. <laughs> so what is any more challenging, interesting, or inspiring about internet-based applications? Notice that we say internet-based applications and not web applications. That's the first thing you're going to have to do if you want to recast yourself as uh, a better engineer than a 12-year-old. Um, anybody can build a web application. An internet application might have voice or uh, WAP interfaces and potentially could be a little bit more difficult. So let's talk about challenges that are related to technologies. Um, these are the simpler ones. So basically, what if you're in the bathtub reading New Yorker magazine in the morning and you want to know what's on your calendar? You, want, you have a web-based calendar system of some sort. Uh, that you could check easily if you were at a browser, but you're in the tub and you want to know, well, do I have to get out of this tub and stop reading this article? Um, or can I hang out here for a while? It's going to depend on what's on your calendar for that morning. Um, wouldn't it be ni nice? It turns out that voice and hearing are often the free channel, as Nicholas Negroponte said, I think, about 15 years ago. So basically, you, don't, you can't type because your fingers are wet. Um, you can't read because there's no screen anywhere near you, and it might be hard to get one that was working. Well, maybe it's all fogged up in a bathroom. Uh, but you certainly can hear and you can talk. Um, similar thing if you're driving in your car and you want to know what the population of Thailand is. Maybe you're on your way to the airport and you're curious about the country. Um, that's your only option. OK. Um, there are some missing features in typical web-based applications that you guys might want to implement. So shareable and portable sessions. Um, it's interesting that if you go to photo.net, you can share your photos. If you go to Yahoo Clubs, you can share your documents. Um, the one thing you can't really share is your experience of using the internet. If you have a friend or your grandmother or something and you're at a site and you want to show that person what it is that you're up to, uh, well, maybe if they have exactly the same brand of computer and the same special software, they can see what you're doing with the browser. But otherwise, it's going to be pretty tough. Um, wouldn't it be nice if, um, if you're planning a trip on away.com, if your friends could just connect and see the pages that you're going through, talk to you maybe in an audio, shared audio channel? Um, there's also an issue of portable sessions. What if you start browsing on a desktop computer with a big screen and you want to finish your session in a taxi? Let me try to bump up the fonts. I'm sure you guys can't read that. Fonts. That's a little better. <clears throat> OK, portable sessions. So you want to start browsing on uh, a computer and then finish. Actually, yeah, maybe I will let you drive. Scroll down a bit. Um, So uh, a portable session, I think, is an interesting thing. So let's also talk about mobile phones a little bit. So far, they haven't been very interesting, and that's about to change. So you might say, I'm an engineer. I don't have to worry about dealing with a failed technology like WAP. Well, there's a technology that's almost identical in Japan called iMode that's been a huge success. And it's not very different from WAP. So let's look at that for a second. The iMode system is always on. So you get an iMode page. You can leave it sitting there for an hour or two without paying anything. 
And if you want to then follow one of the links from that IMO page to another one, you pay uh, you know a few yen uh, on a uh, I don't know per kilobyte basis or something. Uh, WAP, on the other hand, when you're using WAP, you can't use anything else. You're dedicating a channel to that, and um, it's uh, very expensive. So you uh, say, oh, okay, well, I'm done now. And then, oops, I forgot I wanted to follow one link, so you have to reconnect. It's kind of cumbersome. It's more like using, I don't know, a dial-up ISP than the regular Internet. Uh, so that's one difference between iMode and WAP. iMode is always on. The other difference is the phone company over in Japan share some of its revenue with the service providers. So if you look at Sprint PCS, it's almost laughable what they think people are interested in. So here's my Sprint P PCS phone, and you know the big links from um, my uh, phone are Amazon.com. I can go shop for books on this phone. I mean, if I were out walking around, I'd probably go into a bookstore, and if I'm not at home, I'd probably use a web browser. So who's going to shop for books on Amazon.com? So these phone company guys don't have a lot of imagination. In Japan, they didn't say, oh, let's get phone company guys with more imagination. They said, let's make it possible for people with imagination to do creative things. And we'll share, since we have a good billing mechanism, we'll share you know, about 9% of our revenue as we're getting rich off of all these connect minutes, or uh, in this case, per byte charges, with the people who actually create that. Oops, this thing turned itself on also. Um, the uh, situation will change in the US and in Europe this year with something called the General Packet Radio Service, GPRS. So that's going to make WAP surfing several times faster and more important, it'll make it always on. And as an engineer, the interesting thing is that it's going to make it possible for you to do voice and WAP decks at the same time. So you can have a service with a, what we call a mixed mode user interface. And as engineers, it introduces the problem of you have to figure out what makes sense to do in voice and what makes sense to do in um, text. So we're going to experiment a little bit with that this semester here at ADU. You'll get some experience building voice apps. You'll get some experience building WAP apps. And when you're done, you'll be able to make this kind of choice. Uh, an example that I give that's pretty canonical is um, airline booking. There's thousands of choices for departure and arrival cities. It's nice to be able to speak those but maybe there's only 10 flights that are being presented as an option. You don't want to listen to the flights and the connecting cities and have to keep that all in your head and then pick one. It's much easier if that gets printed on a WAP deck because it's not thousands and thousands of options. It's only 10 possible options. Scroll up and down and make your choice from a WAP deck. Okay, and that'll be possible, like I said, uh, later this year in most parts of the world. Okay, personalization front. This is another interesting thing. Um, most web services have a screen that contains navigation here, navigation here, advertising up here, some publisher's content in the middle, maybe some comments at the bottom. Um, pretty much everything in the database queried out and presented on one page doesn't work very well when you only have a few lines of display. And in fact, even when you have that strategy of UI, as services become more and more popular, it's easy for people to get lost in them. So corporate knowledge management systems, I talk about this, or knowledge sharing systems. When they're started, people are happy just to have the service. But after four or five years, they say it's overwhelming. There's a 1,000 new documents that are being put into the system every day. And uh, to find the ones that are of interest to me would take you know, two hours, and I'm just not interested in doing that. Well, I think that um, if you had a computer system that was smart enough to pick the three that are most likely to be interesting to you, and then display them on your app phone, that would be an interesting thing to engineer. And we're going to talk about how to do that later in the semester. I think it can be done with uh, some standard full text search tools, but applied in a different way. Um, OK, uh, there's a more interesting challenge of, you know, can the computer help me be all that I can be? So what does that mean? Um, <laughs> yeah. Dan says he could sign you up for the Army. So, you know, what are you going to work on as an engineer? You'll have to figure this out in another two months when you graduate. What most engineers work on is stuff that's easy to engineer. So I say, okay, well, here's this TV set. And it was engineered 50 years ago. Uh, so it has a certain resolution. 
well, 50 years now, later now, if I can get enough uh, bandwidth together, I think I can engineer something with twice as much resolution. So you get something like HTTV, which is actually easy to engineer, was successfully engineered, but it turns out to be not very related to what human beings want. So um, the alternative way to put this question is if you could be 20 pounds thinner or you could watch Laverne and Shirley in HTTV, which would you pick? <laughs> so I think that a good way to uh, a good way to start an engineering project is actually with a tape measure and uh, a trip to the local bookstore. So you go down to Wordsworth or Barnes and Noble, um, and you just go to the self-help section and you start measuring the shelf space allocated to different kinds of books, and you assume that okay. The more books there are on a particular subject, that shows unmet human aspirations. Because if people can do, if they're already successfully doing something, there's no books on how to tie your shoes. Um, that's because most people have figured it out. On the other hand, there are lots of books on how to lose weight, and I think we can infer from that that, you know, it's uh, a struggle for some people. That it's not a met aspiration. So, well, what about athletes? The good athletes, how do they do it? Almost all of them seem to have coaches. They don't do it by themselves. You know, they, they have the same willpower problems that people who are dieting have. The difference is they have a full-time coach who is sitting there yelling at them and telling them what to do all the time. Um, can we build a network-based diet coach that's all computer-based so it won't be expensive like having a human being to follow you around all the time? So I thought, okay, let's build this computer system called Dr. Rachel. And again, we're not 12-year-olds, so it has to do more than um, just interact via the web. So, you know, at 0900, if you're walking to work, you should be able to call Dr. Rachel from your mobile phone and say, um, you know, I had a glass of orange juice this morning for breakfast. So she's got to know what time it is in your time zone. Um, she's got to know that you haven't called in for a while uh, and therefore that you're probably going to be calling in to report breakfast and put herself in a breakfast mood. You might say, well, why is it important for the computer to put herself in a breakfast mood? It's because computers are terrible at voice recognition. And the narrower the domain, the better they do. So if the computer, there's dragon systems, right? Um, dragon dictate, I think it's called. And that works OK if you do hours of training, if it's in a completely quiet room, if it knows exactly who you are. Um, but still, it struggles because it doesn't know what you're talking about. You can talk to dragon dictate about anything. And we're going to experiment later this term. Maybe I'll have you guys do this as a homework assignment to call up the Lab for Computer Science Jupiter system and play around with a system that doesn't know who you are, doesn't rely on a high-quality voice connection, just uses a telephone, uh, but knows that you're talking about the weather and therefore can give you pretty uh, remarkably good results. So anyway, you say I had a glass of orange juice. She asks, you know, how big was it? Let's scroll down. Um, keep going up. 10.45, you know, your programmer office mate brings in donuts. You're sitting at your computer anyway, so, you know, you pull down um, the uh, Dr. Rachel web page from your bookmarks. You say that you had a donut. You know, she can show you a summary page of where you are in your diet, how fat you're likely to be. Um, you know, 1.30, you're in a cafe and it's noisy, so you think, okay, I don't want to be shouting into my cell phone like a yuppie asshole. What? What? Um, you know, that, that would be a good situation where you're not at your computer, but the voice channel really isn't free because it's so noisy in the cafe. So in that case, you know, you probably would want to use WAP to report what you ate for lunch. Um, if your desktop computer crashes, you might want to talk from a wired phone. If you go, if you're going back from the gym, you have to call Dr. Rachel and explain your workout. You know, and finally, when you get on a scale in the evening, you want to say, okay, this is the weight as reported by the scale, and that lets Dr. Rachel correct some of her ideas about uh, what your estimates are, what it means when you say medium. Okay, so Dr. Rachel's going to need, this is a pretty challenging project, an adaptive model of the user, and that um, you know, includes things like what's your personality like, what do you find annoying, do you want to be contacted, or do you want to be, um, uh, do you always 
want to wait for uh, the user to call your system. Sort of databases about dieting and calorie counting. Um, web browser interface, WAP browser interface, conversational voice interface. So, it, you know, this is the kind of thing a 12-year-old would have trouble building, I think. Uh, I'm not saying it's a huge project. You could probably get it in a few, uh, in a few months of hard work uh, to some reasonably refined state. Okay, there's a Stanford document linked here um, that provides more evidence other than my bookstore. So this is a different case, right? These sociologists went out and sort of surveyed people to find out exactly what they were doing with the internet. They gave them web TVs and then carefully studied their usage. So they found that basically email and reference library, looking up questions and learning, were the most common aspects of uh, consumer internet usage. That shopping was pretty d far down the list. They weren't very interested in business to consumer e-commerce. Um, so I think, again, that we can look at these as unmet human goals. People are looking for connections to other people, and they're looking for knowledge. So as an engineer, though, you have to ask yourself, where can I contribute? Um, you don't want to say, I'm going to become you know, a great chair engineer, because you're not going to be probably rewarded for your contributions, and you're not going to have accomplished that much, because there's already plenty of good chairs. That's not, a hard, not considered by most people to be an unsolved problem. Um, what if the two people, so let's stick with human connections. What if they already know each other really well? Well, at that point, they have all kinds of options for communicating. They can meet face to face. They can pick up the phone and talk to each other and you know, pay a few cents a minute. They can uh, use Microsoft MSN. I don't know if you've seen this. There's this MSN messenger thing where you can call any number in the US for free. And Microsoft, I guess, carries your traffic. Well, the traffic is carried over the public internet until it's terminated in I guess some local city, and then Microsoft pays for the local phone call at the other end. I don't think AT&T Long Distance is happy to see this service being operated. I don't think for a 21st century engineer like yourself, um, there's much of a challenge. What if the people don't know each other already? Can technology help? And the first question you might ask is, why should technology help? Why do you want to be connected by computer systems and internet to a bunch of random losers that you've never met? Why not just talk to the people you already know, your friends and your family? And there's some arguments against this. The most powerful one comes from Mark Granaventer, uh, 1973. He's a sociologist who did his thesis, I think, his PhD thesis, on how people get jobs. He was interested in that. And he found that the people that you know, they know the same people that you know, and they know the same things that you know, by and large. So if you want a job, turning to your best friends is a bad idea. Um, it was basically weekly tied people, friends of friends of friends, that were able to get you a job. And it was actually people with a lot of weak ties that created more jobs, more businesses, and did better for themselves as well. Um, the societies and the groups with a lot of weak ties are better than uh, at dispersing information than groups with um, uh, isolated clumps. So let me give you an example. Massachusetts is the high-tech industry here, and all up and down the East Coast, actually, tended to be organized into tightly knit clumps. So you basically had a uh, suburban campus for some big company like DEC or Data General or IBM, and those people talked amongst themselves, but they didn't talk to people in other organizations very much. Um, we'll contrast this with Silicon Valley, where there were somewhat smaller companies in somewhat tighter quarters. And people, because they hopped around in their jobs a lot, they had a lot of weak ties to people at old companies. And because they could meet together, the culture was not quite as insular. Uh, in Silicon Valley, Technology disperses much, much faster. Technological ideas disperse much, much faster than on the East Coast. And eventually, of course, uh, you know, the East Coast companies pretty much were put into the shade by uh, the Silicon Valley companies. Microsoft is another good example. Now, um, you know, due to their rather fat monopoly on the desktop operating system, I don't think they suffered financially from this too much. However, they were very, very late to the Internet uh, problem. 
They really didn't see internet applications and web-based applications as an interesting problem to work on until several years after most companies and most people in Silicon Valley. Because again, they're off in uh, Redmond, Washington. They're not even in the city of Seattle. They mostly talk to each other. And it was quite easy for them to believe that, okay, um, let's stick with the challenge presented by desktop applications. So I think that, um, I think there is strong evidence for the benefits of weak ties. Okay, so I think the internet is a good place to meet new people because there's a lot of people on the internet and they're relatively easy to contact. Um, how do you find them though? Do you want to just spam email out to all 100 million internet users and say, okay, I have this question, I have this problem? You know, there's people who try that. Uh, I'm sure you've had the experience of getting email from people you didn't know. Um, but you probably didn't feel like helping them. <laughs> so I think that if you have an information system where individuals interested in a particular subject can communicate with each other, that you're more likely to get an answer. And that's an online community. So this is what we're going to learn how to build this semester. Online communities. Um, and we're going to focus on the second big goal which is learning. So you're not meeting each other for the purpose of getting a job. You're meeting each other for the purpose of sharing knowledge and finding out what the other person knows. So let's step back a bit and look at how technology has been applied in this area. So most engineers, when given the brief of build some high-tech system to make education better, they'll say, well, I'm going to find a great teacher. I'm going to find somebody like Shy. I'm going to amplify him enormously. I'm going to amplify his abilities by, I'm going to put him into a can. So we're going to have Shy in the can. And we're going to ship millions of these cans all over the world um, to lots of new students that he's currently not able to reach. So how did that happen? In the 60s, we shipped the cans via closed circuit television. Stanford was a pioneer in this area, shipping lectures via closed circuit TV to companies all over Silicon Valley. In the 70s, the Chinese had a really big can shipping program that was based on satellite. They'll say, we're going to take the greatest teachers in China, we're going to ship them to all the villages via the satellite system. In the 80s, VHS videotapes got really cheap, so we shipped the cans on VHS videotape. In the 90s, oh, well, let's ship the cans via streaming video. That'll be really innovative. So it's been 40 years. Um, go to the, well, here's an experiment for you. Go to the Harvard campus and stop random people and find out how well educated they are. Uh, or I guess you could walk across the street to the MIT campus more easily. And then, you know, go to, uh, I don't know, actually Richmond, Virginia is always good. I took an Italian friend to, uh, she started here in Boston and she would say, Philip, you know, in, in Italy they say that Americans are all really fat and you know, I just don't see it. I don't understand why they say that. So we were going to um, down in Williamsburg, Virginia, for whatever reason, and we stopped in Richmond because they have the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts there, which is great Art Nouveau collection, and also um, the uh, cigarette, Marlboro Cigarette Factory. You can take a tour of the Marlboro Cigarette Factory, which is very interesting. All the machines are actually made in Italy and uh, England. There's no American machines. The factory. So anyway, we stopped at McDonald's, and she walked in the McDonald's, and her jaw just dropped. Everybody there was a whale. I mean, there was not a single person in that McDonald's who weighed less than 200 pounds, and I'm including 10-year-old children. Uh, <laughs> so, Dan, what was the point of that? <laughs> What? There was, there was something, there was a point in there. Oh, yeah, so go into that, right, thank you. Yeah, so go into that Richmond, Virginia McDonald's and talk to those folks and see, you know, how their level of education compares to what you find on the MIT or the Harvard campus. Because after 40 years of all this technology applied to education, you'd think that if it were to work, um, that the education levels would come into close correspondence. But it doesn't seem to have. Um, and I think that 
we're much better off, instead of increasing the number of learners per teacher, that we increase the number of teachers. So what does that mean? Does everybody want to go into teaching? Well, if you say, here's your job, 40 hours a week for the next 30 years, and it's teaching, a lot of folks are going to say, that's not too much fun. I'd rather do it more informally. Okay, what's informal teaching and learning look like? Well, informal learning looks like, you know, sitting at home at 3 in the morning uh, reading a book on quantum mechanics. Okay, let's apply that to informal teaching. So it's 3 in the morning, you just learn something about quantum mechanics, you start calling up your friends and uh, teaching them. You say, hey, I just learned this cool thing about quantum mechanics. Um, so, you know, if you call three or four of those friends, let's say uh, between uh, 3.15 a.m. and uh, 5 a.m., you know, you may find that they're not as excited about teaching whenever you feel like teaching as you are. Well, who would be excited about that? What if you could go to some kind of information system and click a button and say, show me the unanswered questions? Actually, Dan, let's do me a favor and start a new browser window and go to Go to photo.net slash bboard QA forum here and click on unanswered questions. So I hope there's some, yeah. Okay, so basically, what if it's 3 in the morning, you feel like teaching, and you're interested in photography, and you know a little something about photography. Um, these are pretty hard ones. Renting a Nikon, renting a Nikon in Budapest, Hungary. Well, if you're Hungarian, you're probably going to know the answer to this question if you're a Hungarian photographer. And so it might be fun to and satisfying to answer that question at 3 in the morning. Um, Scott Thompson is going to be quite happy to get your answer. He's going to get it emailed into his mailbox directly as an alert. Uh, you can answer maybe a few more of these questions, and then you can go to sleep when you feel tired. OK, let's go to the other browser window. Um, imagine if every learning photographer had a group of experienced photographers answering his or her questions. Um, that's really what photo.net is about. Uh, the MIT administrators are talking about, imagine if every current MIT student had an alumnus mentor. That's much more effective. Since there's 90,000 alums and about 900 faculty, it seems like if we can get some discretionary teaching and mentoring and coaching effort out of the alums, that's much more likely to result in an increased learning on campus and an improved campus experience than it is to try to somehow squeeze more out of the existing 900 faculty. Um, if you want to get help from all these people, though, note that you have to take more social interaction and turn it into computer-mediated social interaction. So in other words, if you are uh, just teaching face-to-face -face on campus, paper handouts are great. Face-to-face -face conversations are great. Telling the students, this assignment that I just handed you on paper is due one week from now, that all works fine. But if an MIT alumnus in California is to help somebody who's on campus right now, that doesn't work. You really need a system that keeps track of, here's the handouts, here's the assignments, here's when they're due, because then the alumnus has what's called visibility into what's happening on campus and can help and say, okay, well, um, then, then, the, then the mentor and the student have a shared context. Okay, what's hard as an engineer about building online communities? They're challenging because learning is difficult and people are idiosyncratic. That's fundamentally the uh, problem. Building compilers is actually pretty easy in a way because um, the grammar of the language doesn't change and the instruction set of the computer doesn't change. So it might occupy you. You might have to work for three months to get a, to build a working compiler for some straightforward computer language. But then you'd be done, and you'd never have to look at the code again, assuming it was correct. Well, when you build a service for, say, 200 people to interact, even if they're very happy with it, um, well, what if they all tell their friends and the community grows to 2,000 people or 20,000 people? You'll find that the solution you built for 200 doesn't work very effectively for the rest. I'll give you an example. What if you, just a simple example of a page where you list all the people who visited in the last day. Well, that's great in your 200 user community. It's a small page. It gives you an idea of who's using the service. If you were to do that on photo.net, though, you'd be looking at uh, a page with something like 20,000 uh, 
20,000 entries. So, you know, nobody wants to look at 20,000 lines of stuff. So it's not that, you know, your engineering approach has to change. You can, you know, still probably run the same database and the same web server, or maybe even the same physical computer, but the way that you think about the interaction has to change. Um, and uh, I give you some hope. If you came here to build a grubby e-commerce site, uh, so if you just want to learn how to do e-commerce, I don't think anybody does anymore now that all those companies have gone bankrupt, fortunately. But um, note that the most successful commerce sites are communities. So Amazon, of the e-commerce sites, was the one that had the strongest community element in that they had a collaboration mechanism for, for uh, readers to write reviews that each other that uh, other readers could read, and they crushed all their online bookstore competitors, of which there were probably a hundred or so. I don't know, maybe a little bit fewer. But everybody had access to the same data that Amazon started with, which was um, a catalog from Ingram of all the books that are published. And uh, the only edge Amazon really had was a somewhat better presentation, a somewhat better user experience. But I think first and foremost, the social aspect where you could see what other people thought of the product you were about to buy. Okay, so let us, that's the challenge, that's the inspiration. Let me um, back up here for a minute. Here's a paper I wrote, it was linked. The only people who have seen this are people who read slash dot. It's not otherwise publicly linked because it's still a draft. So teaching software engineering, this is what we learned. Some of you guys, well, I don't know, Raise your hand if you care, and the only reason you'd care about this is if you kind of uh, read the curriculum for 6916 in advance and thought this was going to be an exciting course. So raise your hand if you had any preconceived ideas about what you would learn this month. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. So we'll talk about this. Um, so basically, how did it used to work at MIT? Well. In the old, old days, like four years ago, um, and from four years ago to, say, uh, 25 years ago, MIT taught you a bunch of theoretical stuff and enough practical stuff that you could graduate and build Microsoft Word by yourself, uh, at, you know, some sort of desktop app that listened to the mouse and the keyboard one user at a time. So we thought to ourselves, well, that's good, but a lot of people who graduate from MIT actually end up needing to build things that look more like Amazon.com. Uh, or more like photo.net. So let's try to have a course that teaches them how to do that. I think I may need to scroll here. There's so much crud. So what do we think we had to teach people? We had to teach them about object-oriented design, where each object is a web service. So a little bit about distributed computing over the Internet, where the computation is distributed among physical web servers run and controlled by non-cooperating people. Um, about concurrency and transactions. So you have to worry about transactions because your connection to the user could be interrupted at any time. The internet is not guaranteed to be reliable. And uh, you have to worry about concurrency because if you have um, a thousand users simultaneously using the service, there's a chance that all thousand will try to perform the same operation at the same time and you have to decide what that means. What if they all try to respond to the same discussion forum posting and what order do their uh, responses appear? What if they all try to buy the same airplane ticket and it's the last one? Um, how to build a stateful user experience on top of stateless protocols. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. But the basic idea is that each web request is uh, an isolated event as far as the web server goes. So unlike Microsoft Word, which remembers, okay, I was started. This user's here using me. Um, HTTP doesn't work like that. And yet users expect a stateful experience. They expect if they put something in their shopping cart that it will still be there on the next page load. Um, the relational database management system is a good way to control concurrency, to achieve integrity around transactions, and to keep enough state on the server side that you can remember what it is that the user was up to. So we'll talk about that in a bit. In a bit. Uh, can you scroll down there? Oh. Um, keep scrolling. What skills? We wanted to teach people some skills. Um, the two skills I think that we wanted to teach them were the three skills. One was dealing with a real client. What does it mean to take vague aspirations 
uh, vague goals, and some of which are trivial to implement, some of which require AI. Um, turn that into precise set of features that can be built for version 1.0, for version 2.0, for version 3.0. So we want to teach them that skill of uh, reducing vague requirements into precise requirements, the skill of rapid prototyping and testing with real users, and also the skills of dealing with extreme requirements. So basically, what do you do when somebody says, I need um, you know, this really complicated web service. It has to be just like Amazon.com with all those features, and I need it three months from now. So how do you do that? Well, we try to teach them two methods, one of which was automatic code generation. So coming up with a higher level machine readable specification of what the web experience ought to be, and then how to write a computer program that generated the relational database table definitions, and then all the scripts necessary to support the web experience. So that if you change your mind about how you wanted it to work, you could just regenerate everything. And also that would presumably go a little bit faster and result in fewer bugs and fewer inconsistencies. The second thing we tried to teach was using a toolkit. How do you use a big toolkit of software to build the thing that you want quickly and not get too distracted? Okay. Um, survey courses. So one thing that we did was uh, we made it a survey course because we like survey courses. Um, you took one of them already, 6001. And although you don't realize it, you were engaging in something sort of revolutionary in that respect. It's still the case that you know, the average university wants you to spend a term learning the syntax of some complicated language, uh, you know, like ML or Java maybe. Um, then another term on data structures, another term on algorithms, another term on um, building translators between high-level languages and low-level languages, um, a term spending about AI algorithms. And notice that in 6001, when you took it, you got almost all that stuff. You covered virtually the entire computer science curriculum at a shallow, shallower level of detail in one semester. So I don't know. Maybe some of you didn't. If you don't like, if you didn't like your first course here or your first computer course here, then you really will hate this one because it's really the same idea, basically, which is to keep you focused. Actually, it's a little bit um, more focused than 001 in a sense because we stay with the same problem all semester of building an online learning community, um, and you'll see why. Yeah. The, the issue that we talked about before, you know, about some of your former students, when you're all done giving them this, this big picture about software, about web applications, and then they say, what did we get out of the course? We weren't tickled. There are the same minority of people. If you ask them after they've done 6 double oh, what did you learn in this course? I learned scheme. Scheme. <laughs> right. Right. So <laughs> that, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't say that this idea is bad, but it points out a challenge in the, in the whole curriculum, which which is a good thing to, uh, to overcome. Yeah. Um, all right. Problem sets, projects, exams. So the key with um, the key thing with the old six nine one six curriculum, the problem sets were unrelated to each other. So there was a conference room scheduling system. There was a family tree system. Um, there was a knowledge management system, which was largely auto-generated. Uh, there was a basics problem set, which we preserved. There was a content management system. Uh, but they were basically all unrelated, and they were unrelated to the project that the students were doing. And the projects were idiosyncratic. So the projects ranged from you know, outsourced IT for animal shelters. That's arfdigita.org. I'm sure you guys have seen that. To a photo sharing system on photo.net, the PhotoDB system. To a collaboration system for gen genetic scientists to upload and download gene sequences. They were all over the map. Uh, sometimes those, I'm remembering the ones that were good. There were a lot of disasters where the clients really didn't want anything very interesting built. There was one, oh God, it was for like writing essay evaluation at MIT, and initially the client really didn't want, he wanted a computer system, but everything had to be done on paper because they didn't want any security problems. I don't know, that thing went through about four different iterations, and then didn't all the students on that project quit? No. Yeah, that was 
That was the other one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of students dropped the course, you know, some of the students on another one dropped the course, and uh, it was hard for the students to talk to each other. Well, so, so let's actually, let's, let's talk about what didn't work. Warts in 6916 Classic. So the projects, as I said, um, you know, some people skated by because their projects weren't very interesting. Um, the students couldn't have meaningful exchanges among themselves. So in other words, because the projects were all different, if one student group was presenting a really clumsy interaction design, the other students really didn't feel free to criticize it very much because they'd built something totally different. They built a voice application. They built a WAF application. They hadn't even been working on a web application. So who were they to criticize? They didn't know what the initial specs were. Uh, so I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice that the projects were similar enough that students could share ideas back and forth and have really constructive criticism sessions where they talk about, well, when I did user registration or when I did discussion forums, I chose to do it this way instead. Um, okay. So we said that we as authors had some personal affection for ours digital community system, ACS. We actually decided... So I was sitting there trying to decide which version of, there's now four versions of ACS, and I'm not sure any of them are ideal. Um, you know, that's, I guess now that you have like millions of dollars in venture capital and a bunch of business geniuses, that's what you do to a product. You say, hey, let's have four products and not really have any of them be uh, something we can recommend. <laughs> not that I'm bitter. <laughs> no, no worse than time in Athens. Um, but... Uh, no, but seriously. So we had these four different versions of ACS, and I was sitting there trying to figure out, well, which one are we going to use? You know, I want to teach them something that they can use 10 years from now. Um, you know, and which one of these is most likely to prevail? And I thought to myself, well, actually, was the toolkit good or bad at MIT? In a sense, it was good because some of the most successful students were able to build fairly sophisticated applications fairly painlessly and quickly, and then get on with their lives. You know, go to work on their other courses, um, had a happy client. You know, as long as what the client wanted was pretty close to photo.net and the student was, uh, students were reasonably focused and diligent, they got their projects done quickly. But then I realized, um, well, what did they learn? What did they learn? I mean, the problem sets, the learning was quite effective. They all learned how to do a data model build a database back web application. But when they got ACS, there are some things in ACS that are great, that are reflections, and especially in ACS 3.4, which was you know, tarred up off of uh, photo.net and rsdigital.com. User experiences that were tested with real users and real administrators, reflections of sort of you know, hard one, seven years of experience in operating these services. Um, well, so that was good, except, and they would adopt those for their own projects, but they adopted them uncritically. They never really understood why this was better or worse than some other approach. And there's also a lot of stuff in ACS that's not so good. There's stuff that, you know, really, when I look at it, I think, oh, God, I wish we'd had time to, you know, clean that up, to fix that up. And they also adopted that uncritically. So if you ask them at the end of the term, why does the discussion forum work this way? Why does registration work this way? What's good about you know, this approach to content management? They really didn't have much to say on the subject. So I eventually thought, OK, let's just chuck the toolkit all together and have students build carefully uh, user registration. It's up here at the top. Content management. Think about software modularity. If they're starting to build a bunch of modules, how do they plug together? How do they talk? To how do they publish APIs to each other? A discussion module, which is like the photo.net Q&A forum. Uh, WAP and voice interfaces, so everybody will have a WAP and a voice interface to their community, not just people with a particular project. Um, scaling gracefully, that means how do you put in features that will let the community grow to many, many users without people getting lost. Uh, full text search, we might have to ax that this term, I'm not sure. Uh, personalization and uh, auto-generation of data models. I don't know, there might be some more stuff. But basically, we thought, at least for the core of your application, you're, feel free to share ideas. 
Um, you'll probably do this in groups of two, maybe groups of three, if you know you really have a lot of affection for each other. Um, I don't think it's going to be that much more work. You might say, oh, God, now I have to do all this myself. Why should I do all this myself when I could download you know, ACS 3.4 Tickle or ACS 3.4 Java or <laughs> ACS 4.0 Tickle or ACS 4.0 Java Core and a bunch of other modules that might, might or might not be finished by the time uh, the course is halfway through. Well, let me tell you a story about the B-board on photo.net. took me three days to write. In three days, I had every feature that you can remember from the bulletin board, pretty much. Um, so then what? Then we decided, oh, well, there's this problem users from this IP address. So we have to add this feature to exclude certain IP addresses. And then, you know, then there's this uh, need to identify users who posted more than 100 times in the last few months and be able to ask them to become co-moderators. And we just kept adding more and more features. So I programmed on it for another month or so, probably, over the years. But at its core, to do something pretty interesting and fine for the users 99.9% .9 of the time was only about three days of work. So that's what you're really all about here. You know, on ACS, there's probably 100 possible different registration settings. You can say, I want users to register with or without admin approval, with or without email verification, all that stuff. Well, you don't really need that in, uh, you don't actually need that to have a successful online community. You need that to have a successful product that anybody can use for their online community. But uh, you know, you'll either be using something, you'll either be building something for a corporate, private knowledge management system, in which case your registration policy will can be hard coded to require administrator approval, or you'll be building a public online community where you can hard code it not to require approval. So it's not going to be that much more work, and you'll have the opportunity to see. Uh, well, I don't know how many project groups there's going to be, but let's say there's at least. Uh, 15 project groups. Well, with 15 project groups, you have the opportunity to see 14 other approaches to solving the same problem and really have uh, a dialogue about what's good and what's bad. So I, I'm kind of jazzed up about this. If somebody wants to, you know, really hammer on me and say, I want to use ACS 4.0 Java. I don't know. You could use ACS 4.0 Java. I'm not convinced you would get the problem sets done faster. Uh, <laughs> maybe you would. All right. Let's segue into basics. Um, actually, I'll, I'll take a few questions now. Anybody have any questions? Since we're about to segue into the stuff you need for problem set one and what a problem set one is. Yeah, I'm not, all those different modules you just mentioned, such as um, content management, voice interface, etc., etc. I'm not quite clear what the form of the final project is. You're saying that we would build projects which are similar enough to each other that we'll be able to construct and criticize, uh, and we've got all these different modules. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, what's the form of the, so what are you building? So within the next few days, I'd like each of you guys to pick uh, a topic. So basically, I want you to build an online learning community. Um, and it should either be for a client, so you find a nonprofit organization that wants to run, you know, something, let's say they're a nonprofit organization about land use. Um, that wants to run an online learning community having to do with land use for the public. It could be a, a for-profit or non-profit or whatever organization that wants to have an internal knowledge sharing system, which is a kind of online learning environment. It could be something related to a personal interest. If you can't find a client, um, I might be willing to be a client for somebody who wants to build a site about uh, aquariums because I'm into aquariums, and I think there should be a really good online community for that. And There are some pretty good ones, but they don't have great UIs. So um, if you really don't have any imagination, you could just pick something like, you know, photo.net, uh, like photography, or digital photography, something maybe a little bit simpler than what photo.net tries to do. Uh, the advantage of working with the client is you can get content easily. I think even if you come up with it up, up with it yourself, since you're students, actually, these machines aren't even accessible from the public internet, are they? Yeah, so actually, you know, you could just say, I'm going to build a community around, you know, uh, topic X, grab all the content you want off of other sites, um, and uh, you're not really violating any copyright laws because uh, there's fair use for educational stuff and you're not republishing it anywhere, so you're not injuring the publisher. So basically, when you're done, I want you to have something like photo.net. So th think about it that way. Or imagine a corporate knowledge management system. I guess I could show you some where all the users are teaching each other about 
you know, some aspect of the company's business. Um, so I think, you know, I think that's actually a broad enough brief that almost everybody here should have some area of personal passion. Another thing to look at, actually, we have a whole lot of content related to computer science education. So you might want to say, well, I really want to have a site about algorithms, and I'm going to start with all the AD Uni content, and I'm going to supplement it maybe with my own stuff or stuff elsewhere. Uh, so, and it'll, this will give, I think, a focus to your activities as you do the problem set. So this might be a lot better than 6916 in a way. People were sitting there building their family tree service, and they had to throw it out. They had to throw out everything they did for problem set five because you know, their final project had nothing to do with family tree. Uh, other questions? Well, I don't want to explain what an online community is too much because I don't know how many people showed up at my one-day talk. I saw a few of you guys there. Yeah, so you can tell the others. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, yeah, I'm, I'm going to post a whole bunch of project ideas too that have real clients that are at least willing to be clients by email, and there'll be six or seven of those minimally. And, and you can choose from those as well if you don't have a particular one. Yeah, I have one. Remind me, Shai, I have this one from a woman named Dorothy Webman. Okay. Maybe you got that as well. Uh, no, I didn't. Having to do with uh, healthcare privacy laws. So it's a site to teach hospitals about how to comply with these new privacy laws. So if you're interested in really dreary healthcare and legal topics, <laughs> <laughs> you can do that one. Um, but... Uh, all right, let's talk about um, what you're going to do in this first problem set. So this first problem set is really to make sure that you can build a database-backed web service, that you understand how to use the building blocks of Internet applications, which at least at first are hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, and also things like HTML. So let's talk about HTTP first. Um, I'm going to use the blackboard here. Not, not for too long, so don't, don't worry too much. Maybe I'll use this one. should be easier, right? Eh? All right. So here's the drawing that I wanted Mina Reimer to do, except I only wrote the book chapter over the last few days, so I haven't had time to ask her. Here's two computers. And they're connected by some sort of wire so they can talk to each other. So in the good old days, you had very sophisticated communications protocols in which if program A wanted to talk to program B, program A would start up, say I want to talk to program B. Maybe program B wouldn't have been started. This computer would start up program B. And for as long as they were talking, both programs were running continuously, waiting for the next communication from the other program. So in this case, program B doesn't have any trouble remembering what program A said. It has an obvious place in which to do the remembering. You guys took 6004. I don't know what you call it here, computer architecture. So you remember that computers have memory, right? <laughs> So program B has access to memory. And therefore, if program A says, I want you to put Leo Buscaglia's bus 9 to paradise in my shopping cart, program B can write bus 9 to paradise right here. If he says, I want living, learning, and loving by Leo Buscaglia, Leo Buscaglia, by the way, is a public television lecturer on the topic of love. Uh, he's divorced and now dead, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> he does have a PhD. He's Dr. Leo Buscaglia. Anyway, so um, that's an easy... If you wanted to build online shopping between, between A and B, it doesn't seem to present any real challenge of representing state because B is running all the time and has access to a memory, hard disk, whatever other means of uh, storing state and persistence you have on the uh, public Internet. All right, so can anyone think of a communications protocol that we have seen that is stateful in this sense, where you have two, com two programs, they're running all the time, they stay running, and it has state in the sense that these guys are up and running. Any ideas? 
for a protocol. I think you've you've heard about protocols in 6033 systems. Louise must have told you about. Throw out some. Any what? Asynchronous? What's asynchronous? I guess I should have taken this course. <laughs> I want a specific one. Phillips protocol. It's got to have a name. You shouldn't have to look too far. Ah, OK, not a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, so T TCP is a good example. Uh, as long as a TCP session is up and running, I think it's generally true that you do have the uh, two programs continuously operating on both sides. And uh, it remembers what packets I've gotten so far, what packets I'm going to get. I don't know. I don't think it's worth going through the others. But this is TCP is an example. It's a very refined example of protocol designs that go back 30 and 40 years. And that was how communications was done. All right, so the web came along. Totally different. Apparently, these guys in Switzerland were not with the program. Because HTTP is stateless and anonymous. Um, let's talk about that a little bit more. We'll, we'll, we'll pull those apart individually. For the moment, you might say, why do we care? I don't care about HTTP. I only want to build voice applications. Or, you know, Greenspun, you're a dinosaur. I don't want to build web applications like you were building five years ago. I want to build WAF applications. The reason you still want to know about HTTP is twofold. First of all, as it happens, the way that you build a WAF application is you serve WML over HTTP to the Sprint PCS proxy. So you're still using HTTP even though your user's on a mobile phone. That's point one. Point two is with voice XML, you can actually build a voice application using nothing more than HTTP. And that's probably the way that most voice applications will be built. Instead of serving HTML, you're serving VXML documents. Um, the third reason to learn about HTTP is that once an idea like that catches on, it tends to be copied and copied and copied and reused. So I think that you will find that more and more protocols uh, that you encounter during your engineering life are going to be, if they're not exactly like HTTP, they're going to be, if they're not HTTP, HTTP they may well copy significant elements from HTTP. Okay, so it's stateless. We've requested this web page. If we um, follow a link back to philip.greenspun.com, that's going to be an independent session. If we request 10 pages from photo.net, um, that's 10 independent HTTP sessions. And unlike the example on the blackboard, in between requesting those pages, I could restart the browser on my desktop. And any time when one of those pages isn't being served, the publisher could restart the server on the server side. And as far as the user is concerned, the user experience would be the same. So that shows you that it's stateless. And in fact, it also indicates that there may be a problem because if the program on the server side can be restarted constantly, it's not obvious where you put the information 